Hello. Welcome to this uh, live stream. Hopefully you can see and hear me okay. I'm looking at a PowerPoint. Um, if it's all working properly, can you just give me a quick hello or a thumbs up or something, just so I know that we're we're all good. I can't see it working. Let's see. Oh no, okay. I think we are on now. So yeah, can you guys see and hear me? Cool. Thanks, Emma. Nice. <laughs> perfect, perfect. So um, yeah, welcome to the first biology uh, class of the year. Happy New Year, if you were um, joining us on before. Uh, oh, perfect. Thanks. Thanks, guys. <clears throat> um, so yeah, we're looking at DNA and RNA today. We're going to spend about an hour going through the, the topic. A uh, super important subject for A-level biology. It features uh, throughout the AS uh, syllabus and also the A2, like from gene technology to meiosis. This is important for all of that stuff. Um, so yeah, let's let's jump straight in. Uh, a little bit about me. My name's Alex. Uh, I'm the lead biology teacher here at Snap Revise, uh, and I've been tutoring and teaching for about five or six years now. Um, yeah, so if you've been to one of these sessions before, you'll be familiar with this. The, what we normally start with is this revision pyramid, kind of just some related ideas to get warmed up, um, ready to, to focus on the, the topic that we're going through. So we're going through DNA and RNA. So some of these questions would have done in previous lessons, building up to it. Um, some might just be kind of random but useful things which is going to be good to to review uh so yeah let's go let's go through so with these sessions i'm going to ask you guys questions i do encourage you to um <laughs> to have a go and like write an answer and post it in the chat it is like a live session so it, it's designed to be interactive so yeah if you write an answer i can look at it and see if it see if it's correct that sort of thing these are one hour sessions so we'll be finishing at five o'clock uk time um so yeah first question what is the induced fit model we'll start our way through i can see some of you got answers to the other ones already you can just yeah maybe repost that in a sec so the induced fit model what could you say here? This is a throwback to the enzyme topic, which actually I think we did enzymes in the last live stream. That was just before Christmas, if anybody was in that one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, something to do with the um, idea of the active site. Uh, oops, what am I doing? Right in the wrong site. Active site. Changing shape. When substrate binds. Uh, you could add like a conformational change if you wanted as a keyword. Uh, but you don't need that. Cool. Nice. And... Yeah, that's the main idea. This is like the like the improved version of the lock and key hypothesis. Uh, we realize that actually enzymes aren't these rigid structures. The proteins are flexible and they can they can change shape slightly. So the induced fit model is actually uh, the sort of upgraded uh, way in which they work. So okay, in which protein structure would you find ionic bonding? Like which level? Of protein structure uh yeah exactly it means that it's actually not 100 percent complementary to begin with the the shape changes when it binds i would still say like the substrate and enzyme is still complementary don't like not put that but the um it's not a perfect fit straight away um the 
change in the shape is actually what causes the reaction. So either like the breaking or um, forming of new bonds. So we've got kind of a split, split vote here. Some people are saying secondary. Some people are saying tertiary. It is actually the tertiary structure. Maybe it'd be a good time to just quickly recap. So primary structure, secondary, tertiary, and we can actually have quaternary as the same because quaternary has the same as tertiary. The little circle just means um, like structure. Um, sorry, no, like uh, one with a circle means like primary. So this would be peptide. Peptide bonds. This would be um, hydrogen bonds. And these would be hydrogen ionic and disulfide. You could also add maybe hydrophobic, hydrophilic interactions, but you don't necessarily need to put that. They're technically actually not a type of bonding, but it does help hold the tertiary structure together. So yeah, just make sure that's something that would lend itself quite well to a flashcard just to help you commit those bonds to memory. Um, okay. Next question. What are biological catalysts? What would you say here? That's kind of like a one word answer, or you could give an explanation. Either would be either would be fine. <clears throat> yeah, nice, Aaron. So the one mark answer, we could just say enzymes. Um, why can't I type today? Why can't I write? So the one word answer is enzymes. And we could kind of like define what a catalyst is, which, yeah, Manal, that's what you've done. Nice. <clears throat> so a catalyst can speed up the rate of a reaction without getting used up itself. Um, so that's just generic catalysts and biological catalysts are ones that are usually made of protein and occur in nature. And they're super important for all metabolic reactions. Um, yeah, yeah, usually they're inside the body. Not always though. You can have extracellular enzymes, which work outside of the, the cell that it technically means, but that could also be outside of the body. So if something's digesting something extracellularly, that's probably actually occurring outside of the body but in general yeah they're more likely to be inside than outside um okay cool so next question what is the role of dna the like main role you would say <clears throat> yeah Nice. Stores genetic information. Nice. Um, and that is used to make proteins. We could add that as a second thing. Used to make protein. So what's the word for like all of the DNA in a cell or all of the DNA in an organism. There's another word beginning with G, which you could talk about in this answer. All the genes. In an organism. Oh, just realized that's under the um under the video. Oh well. It just says all the genes slash DNA in an organism. And yeah, you're correct. That is of course the genome. So that's a good uh word to have in your vocabulary. Um nice. And then next one. What is a hydrolysis or condensation reaction? These are two words that come up a lot especially in the biological molecules topic. Um, 
can you define both? They're kind of, they're related, sort of opposites of each other. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, nice. Um, so, kind of a clear in the name. Hydro means water. Lysis means breaking apart. So, hydrolysis. I'm just going to draw an arrow. This is breaking a chemical bond. using water. And then condensation is, yeah, something like, yeah, joining two molecules, that's, that's good. Or like forming a chemical bond. Chemical bond, you could add between two molecules if you wanted. Uh, but the key thing is, you're forming a bond, we're removing water. Put and removing the water molecule. So they would be covalent bonds that you're either forming or breaking. Um, nice. And then, yeah, can you tell me any other facts? about DNA. We're going to go through it anyway, but has anyone got any um, interesting facts or anything like that before we jump in? What do you guys remember? <clears throat> Double helix, yeah. Four bases, nice. There's a crazy stat. I can't remember exactly what it is. Maybe we could look it up. Um, like if you took if you took the DNA from every single cell in your body, it goes like I can't remember exactly what it is. It's like to the moon, or or like to the moon and back, or something ridiculous like that, or like many times around the Earth, just from one one person, which is which is kind of cool. So we have a lot of DNA in our body because we have a lot of cells. Every single cell has a copy of the DNA. Well. Not quite all of them. Ones like the red blood cells don't. But the vast majority of cells have DNA. Um, and humans have around three, three billion base pairs in their DNA. So that's that's a lot of base pairs. Um, a lot of a lot of information. Um so the, the lesson today, we're just gonna focus on the structure of DNA. We're not really gonna do anything on DNA replication. And we're not really going to do anything on protein synthesis. That would sort of build on what we're looking at today. Um, but it's that's like way too much stuff to, to go through. <coughs> well, cytosine, yeah, cytosine and uracil are both bases. So they're both um, things you could say. Yeah, nice. Okay, so we're going to look at differences between DNA and RNA. We're going to look at nucleotides and we're going to look at how we make polynucleotides. This word doesn't get used that often, but basically it just means DNA and RNA. Uh, another word you could call all these together is nucleic acids. This is kind of like a, it's kind of a synonym. Um, I guess not quite because nucleic acids would also include nucleotides, whereas polynucleotide is specifically a chain of nucleotides. Um, but they're kind of they kind of are used interchangeably. I'm going to look at the bonding between complementary base pairs, and this is actually super important for transcription <laughs> and for DNA replication. But we're not going to look at that. Um, to be honest, we'll probably talk about that quickly anyway. But yeah, that's your specs. You should all have a copy of your spec. If you don't, you can just download them. Um. So yeah, let's go through the general structure. So these are representing the monomers of nucleic acids and they are called nucleotides. 
the polymers we can call polynucleotides, as we mentioned. Or they're usually more often referred to by the two main types, DNA or RNA. And there is actually a few different types of RNA. What, what types can you remember? Types of RNA. I think there's three that come up. Yeah, we can have M or messenger. We can have T or transfer. And there's one other one. Yeah, nice. R, which stands for ribosomal, which is like what makes up part of the structure of a ribosome. So yeah, various different types of RNA. Um, in general, DNA. is a double helix. And RNA is a single strand. Um, and there can be some other, other differences. Explain more about ribosomal RNAs, or oh, about the different types. Yeah, yeah. So we, I don't want to go into too much detail because we're not doing transcription, but all three of these are involved in protein synthesis. So messenger is the one that you make during transcription. tRNA is involved um, with translation. It's one that brings the correct amino acids and they have the anticodons on them. And the ribosome one is actually also involved in translation. I suppose arguably messenger is also involved in translation because you're turning messenger RNA into polypeptide chain using tRNA and rRNA. So yeah, actually all three, all three would feature in translation. So DNA, DNA is like a genetic store of information and RNA is what we use when we want to actually make protein from it. So RNA are heavily involved in protein synthesis. DNA is just the sort of template that you're copying from. Um, noise. So let's look at the structure of a nucleotide in a little bit more detail. So this is your phosphate. This is your pentose sugar. And this is an organic base. Sometimes these are called, well, sometimes they're just called bases. Sometimes they're called nitrogenous bases. You might have heard either. It's just the same thing. They're called nitrogenous because they contain a lot of nitrogen. Um, so that's one of the things that plants need nitrogen for. Plants make their own nucleotides from scratch. So they need nitrogen from the soil to, um, to be able to do that. And that's why nitrogen is really important in plant fertilizer. Um, so yeah, let's look at the phosphate. So the phosphate and the pentose sugar, these both interact to form what's called the sugar phosphate backbone. You would join another nucleotide into the sugar phosphate backbone like this. So find neighboring neighboring pento sugar to form sugar phosphate backbone So the pentose sugar is obviously also, also involved in the sugar phosphate backbone. Um, what are the two different types of pentose sugar we get? There's one in DNA and there's one in RNA. It's actually where they get their names from. And as a bonus question, what does pentose sugar actually mean? 
to be honest, actually, you could get it without the word sugar. Pentose by itself means this. Yeah, so DNA has deoxyribose as its pentose sugar. Yeah, pentose means five carbon sugar. Five carbon sugar molecule. Um, you also have hexose, which is six carbon, like glucose or galactose. Um, and you also have three carbon sugars. They're called triose. Uh, one example is triose phosphate, which comes up in photosynthesis and respiration in the A2 syllabus. And yeah, nice. Ribose is the pentose sugar you find in RNA. Yeah, perfect. And then we've got five possible bases. A, T, G, C are the, um, the I was gonna say main ones, but that's probably the wrong word. They're the ones you find in DNA. Let's put that. And RNA, you find A, U, G, C uh, equals RNA. So you can see the difference is DNA has T, RNA has U. So uracil is swapped in for thymine in RNA. We often write the bases just as letters, like I've written there but you do actually need to know the full the full name for them. And I remember seeing one of the examiner's reports one time, and I think the, the report said something like 85% of the students didn't know the full name of the bases, which I was quite surprised by. That seems very high. So if you don't know what they stand for, you do, uh, you do need to know it, and you do need to learn them. So yeah, adenine, thymine, guanine, cytosine, and uracil. Just make sure that you've got those. Um, yeah, got those memorized. But you are okay to use the the sort of one letter version of it for most of the time. Just like just like how like DNA and RNA are very like widely accepted acronyms, you can kind of just write the letter for the base in most cases. Unless the question was basically specifically asking about what the name of it was. Okay, nice. So let's look at uh, how we'd actually form a polynucleotide. So how we're going to join two of these nucleotides together. So the bond that you form between them is known as a phosphodiester bond. Um, it occurs, as we said, between the pentose sugar and the phosphate group. We can... What should we talk about? I'll draw it out first, and then I'll talk about five prime and three prime ends, because that's something that is actually kind of important and that people often don't know. So let's draw our um, nucleotides. So I'm drawing a phosphate group at the moment. You don't actually need to know how to draw a phosphate group technically, but um, it's something that you could you could learn if you wanted. The base would be out here, whatever the base was. So that's one nucleotide. This is actually an oxygen here. Um, you could draw that on if you wanted. And let's draw our other um, phosphate down here. So we have an OH group. So the phosphate is the same as the other one, double bond oxygen, another OH up here, and then oxygen, and then we're into our pentose sugar again. Do, do, do. And our base. Doesn't really matter what the base is. So you can see we've got two OH groups together. This is quite typical of when, oh, whoops, I thought that was a highlighter. 
How do I undo that? Doo -doo -doo. Nope. Okay. Um, okay, yeah, that's what I want to do. So you can see there's an OH group here and there's an OH group here. Those are what are going to react in a, a condensation reaction. So condensation reaction means we're removing water. We're forming a chemical bond through the removal of water. We said that at the beginning. Um, so this is going to come out and we produce water. Let's just put condensation reaction. And so you get one of the options. One of the oxygens remains behind, and that's what actually joins the two molecules together. So the oxygen is here. So if we like, drew what that looked like, you would have one oxygen. So it would go carbon, oxygen, um, phosphate. Like that. And yeah, that's the type of covalent bond, and they're joined together. <laughs> this happens many times in the formation of a polynucleotide. And that's your sugar phosphate backbone. So we talk about three prime and five prime end. You can either just memorize that the one with the phosphate is the five prime end, and the one without the phosphate is therefore the three prime end. Or if you wanted more of an explanation for it, it's because we actually number the carbons in the, the pento sugar. So there's an oxygen up here. You might think five carbons five-sided shapes. There's one carbon on each corner, but it's actually not the case. There's four carbons in the ring and one oxygen, and there's a fifth carbon, which uh, sort of joins the phosphate up here. So if you're numbering the carbons, it's one, two, three, four, and carbon five sticks up like above the a ring joining onto the phosphate. So it's the number of the carbons that correlates to the name of the DNA strand. So this has got the um, join on carbon three available to bind to. So that's the three prime end. Three prime end. This has got carbon five and the phosphate um, sticking up. So that's the five prime end. And if you remember, DNA is anti-parallel. So the strands run in opposite directions. So if one is going three prime to five prime, the other one is going five prime to three prime. That's anti-parallel. Um, Cool, nice. So we could put like, actually no, doesn't matter. So we form it using condensation reactions and we break it um, with hydrolysis reactions. You would need to put in water to turn this back into nucleotides. Okay, so yeah, hopefully that's all making sense and you guys are um, still with me. Um, yeah, how would you? rate your understanding so far i think it's been fairly straightforward so hopefully you guys are yeah erin one nice cool nice yeah good a good sign so let's try some past paper questions then so figure 5.1 is showing part of a dna molecule Name the parts represented by the letter Y and which bases are common to DNA and RNA. Two questions. <clears throat> mm -hmm. Yeah, why is a nucleotide? And yeah, the ones it has in common guanine, cytosine. And adenine. Um, 
understand, but you're nervous for putting an answer. Um, yeah, there's no, there's no judgment for wrong answers, though. Safe space. So, um, yeah, feel free to put put whatever. You got your mock tomorrow. Well, hopefully, some stuff on this comes up. Um, are you are you an A two or an AS student? Because I guess it'd be more likely to come up on an AS paper. Oh, nice. Yeah, that should be that should be good. Okay, so this question, it's a three marker. State three differences between the structure of DNA and the structure of RNA. So make sure you're doing differences. Make sure you're doing structures and then compare DNA and RNA. Uh, a red highlighter looks kind of weird. Um, never really used a red highlighter before. So three structural differences. Yes, we could talk about the pentose sugar. Ribose versus deoxyribose. The pentose sugars. <clears throat> yeah, I can talk about uracil first. I mean, this way I'm writing it isn't really a proper way to do it. On an actual exam paper, you should write DNA has uracil, RNA, sorry, other way around. DNA has thymine, RNA has uracil as a base. This is kind of like a lazy way of writing it. I'm just trying to do it quickly. And yeah, you can talk about single stranded. Versus double stranded. Nice. Um, I think that's probably the most obvious ones, or that I say the best ones. Um, yeah, yeah. Let's just go with this ones. Okay, perfect. So let's look at the bases in a little bit more detail and stuff like complementary base pairing. So this is a really important keyword or oh, complementary base pairing. Um, yeah, you can use it for um, a whole bunch of different different topics. It comes up in DNA replication. It comes up in protein synthesis. It comes up in uh, genetic engineering. Um, and it, all that means is some of the bases are attracted to uh, each other um, and they form they form pairs. So there's four or well, five possible bases, thymine and uracil. They're basically very similar. Uh, you just get thymine in DNA and uracil in RNA, but structurally they're very similar. Um, so they form the same pair. So the bases that pair up, oh yeah, I'll put it actually as a question. Which are the ones that pair together? And does anybody have a good trick for remembering them? Or have you just, just learned them? I think either. It's fine. A and T, nice. Adenine pairs with thymine. Or uracil. And guanine has with um, cytosine. Nice. Yeah, there are bonds between them. And actually, in fact, they form different numbers of bonds. So this pair is formed, is held together by two hydrogen bonds. And this pair is held together by three hydrogen bonds. So if we were to draw that on, let's say that um, 
this is T, this is A, this is um, C, and this is G. So we'd have like two bonds here, and we'd have three bonds, three hydrogen bonds on those ones. Something like that. Perfect. And that's really instrumental in holding the strands together in DNA. And it's also really important for synthesizing new strands because they only pair with one other type of base. When you want to copy it, they just match up to that complementary base pair. Um, yeah. Hey, one thing. Um, yeah, one thing to add. I think we got it the wrong way around here as well. This should be with an E. Complementary. Yeah. That means like flattering which is not the right word here. It should be the one with the E, complementary, which means that they like fit together. Um, so yeah, it's a really common mistake. You actually, you usually wouldn't get marked down for it, but just something to be, something to be aware of. I think it's all over this page. Um, yeah, this one's correct. So nice. So we talked about the um, kind of talked about the bonds already. So A and T, they form two. They're actually technically here and here. Not that it really matters that much. And G and C can form three. What actually is a hydrogen bond out of interest? Does anybody want to have a go at defining it? It might not be something you've already given too much thought to. Yeah. Yeah, they can form between dipoles. Yeah. So they're and they're weak bonds. So weak bonds formed between uh we can put you might have seen delta positive and delta negative um uh let's put atoms so nitrogen uh when it's got hydrogen bonded to it can form uh hydrogen bonds oxygen or an oh group can also form hydrogen bonds and it's all to do with um how well the molecules attract the electrons. We're kind of going into too much detail here, but say like a molecule like oxygen, it's very electronegative. It's actually good at attracting the electrons close to it. So it pulls the electrons closer. That makes it slightly negative. Electrons have a negative charge. It's not actually an ion. An ion is something that's got an extra electron that has a negative charge. This is just acting a little bit like a negative ion. It's slightly negative. That's what the delta negative means. And likewise, something like a hydrogen is not very electronegative. It's not very good at attracting the electrons. So it becomes slightly positive. It behaves slightly like a positive ion, which would have lost an electron. They haven't actually lost electrons. They just are slightly positive. So that's delta positive. So positives and negatives attract because they're not actually fully positive and negative. The attraction isn't as strong as an ionic bond, which is between an actual positive and negative charged ion. So they're weaker. They're weaker than that. They're, they're one of the weakest types of bonding, but they still like, yeah, there is like some attraction there. Um, <laughs> yeah, you talk a lot about hydrogen bonds in, um, in the water topic because water it, like famously forms hydrogen bonds and that actually, that creates a lot of the um 
a lot of the weird properties of water, like it's high specific heat capacity, high latent heat vaporization, the fact that it's more dense as a solid, adhesion, cohesion. This is this is all explained by hydrogen bonding. Yeah, van der Waals comes up in the Mark schemes a lot. I think more for chemistry though than for biology, but could be in the biology ones as well. It's just like intermolecular forces. So attraction between the, the molecules, um, essentially. Uh, I think, where would it come up in biology? It might come up in the saturated versus unsaturated fatty acids in membranes. It could come up in that topic, yeah. Okay, nice. So yeah, let's look at the structure and function of DNA. So DNA, we said has a double helix. Um, it, it is actually a very stable molecule. Part of the reason it's so stable is because it's double stranded compared to RNA, which is single stranded. DNA is way more stable. And that's because all the bases are sort of hidden away in the middle and they're bound to a complementary base pair. So let's put um, bases hidden in the middle. And complementary uh, and bound to complementary base pair. I'm just going to put CBP. This helps prevent. What would you call a change in base sequence? Yeah, helps prevent changes in base sequence, AKA mutations, which we typically don't want. We try to not have mutations. Mutations usually are bad. Occasionally you get a good mutation and that's actually what creates new alleles and that's what drives evolution. But you don't really want to be taking the risk. Um, yeah, the vast majority are, are bad. So we try to minimize it. But yeah, if there were no mutations, then there would be no evolution as well. So um, they are an essential part of, of um, biology. So the fact that there's two strands, this is beneficial for replication. And specifically, what's, what um, two words can you use to describe how DNA is replicated? The sort of the meaning of it would be where once one of the new strands is half new DNA. Also, one of the strands is new DNA, one is original parent DNA. Yeah, nice. So this makes semi conservative. So it makes semi conservative replication possible. Um, cool, nice. And then it's a large molecule. Uh, well, uh, specifically, it's a very long molecule. Uh, relative to its width, it would be like way longer than a like piece of string. Um, although, <laughs> what does that mean? Like, how long is a piece of string? Uh, but like, I imagine you had like a ball of yarn. The the thickness of that yarn compared to the length. DNA is way, 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 way longer. It's a really long molecule. And this means it can contain a lot of information. Okay, lots of information. Our, our DNA is around 3 billion base pairs in length, but there are other animals with like with more, particularly actually plants. Plants tend to have a lot of DNA. Um, yeah, it's kind of surprising that the number of chromosomes and the amount of DNA isn't necessarily just correlated with what you think of as like more complex organisms. So things like plants actually can have like a lot more DNA and a lot more chromosomes than, than a human. 
and yeah humans aren't definitely aren't the the animal with the most dna i wonder what that would be i'm going to quickly see if it comes up in a one a one second google search uh longest genome animal uh oh apparently it's a lungfish so yeah, the lungfish has 43 billion base pairs. That's big. Yeah, about 14 times larger than a human genome, which is funny. Um, then the next most is an axolotl. So neither of those are particularly complex organisms. Um, yeah. They're both actually also, they're quite like, they've been around a long time and that's probably why they have such a large genome. Like sections are probably being repeated and it's actually like it's not necessarily a good thing to have a, a large genome like it if there's a lot of like repeat sections in there it's actually quite wasteful you have to keep making all of this dna so yeah it's definitely not necessarily just a, a good thing um but yeah that's interesting about the the lungfish they're as they sound like they are fish that can breathe air um they have they have a lung as well as a gill. They're a very old type of fish. They were they were around when the dinosaurs were around. Um okay. So some more questions. First one, just name the base represented by the letter T. Quite easy. <clears throat> yeah, nice. I mean, and then we need to make a complementary strand. So it's DNA, remember? Making a complementary. Oh, no, sorry. I have misled you. They said make an RNA strand. So this would be like, this would be as if you were making, you were doing transcription. So what would your strand look like? <clears throat> yeah, nice. A, C, G, C, G, U, A. So it's complementary and you just need to remember to do a uracil rather than a, a thymine because um, it's mRNA, not DNA. Okay, then this is another very common type of question. So they'll show you a, a table that has percentages of each base and you have to complete the table. So again, you're looking at complementary base pairing here. So how would you complete the top Right, you can put them as um, just in order, I guess. <clears throat> so best way to do this, fill in the ones that you can do straight away. So these are complementary to each other. Um, so A in one strand will match up with T in the other. So we've got 16% A. So we'll have 16% T in the second strand. And we can fill in these ones as well. 21% C equals 21G up here. So they're complementary. And then we can switch these. So 34. Yeah, nice. So that's literally just like um, filling in the information we have. And then we have to do a little calculation to get the, the last one. So you can kind of just see percentages. This needs to add up to 100%. So what we have to do is 100 minus, we add these all together, 16 plus 34 plus 21. And that will equal our answer. So um, <clears throat> yeah, 
That's I have that equals 71. So therefore it's 29. I'm in there. Is everyone happy with that? How how we got to that answer? Like I said, it's a very, a very common type of question that that comes up. The only thing that they sometimes try and catch you out, it's not always percentage. Sometimes they just tell you the number of bases. In that case, rather than adding up to 100, your bases just need to add up to whatever number they gave you. So they said it's like 100 base pairs. Oh, sorry, <laughs> that would be exactly the same. If they said it was like 75 base pairs, just make sure you're subtracting all the ones that you have from 75 <clears throat> or whatever the number is. And, oh, that's it. That is the the end. So, <clears throat> yeah, we can now describe the differences between DNA and RNA, describe the nucleotides, polynucleotides, and we know about the bonding. So, um, yeah, actually finished a little bit ahead of schedule. I guess it's that's a, maybe a bit of a shorter class than some of the other ones. Um, so, yeah, before we before I end it, do you guys have any questions on on what we went through. I'll give you guys a couple of minutes if you've got anything. Um, and if you don't, <clears throat> then um, yeah, thanks for joining. If you, in, if you enjoyed the session, feel free to subscribe to the, the channel. You can set reminders for these sessions. We do one a month for, um, for each topic. So we also do chemistry, physics, and maths. So if you do any of those subjects, you can sign up for those lessons as well. Um, and if you did enjoy the session, we run these on our website. We do a lot more of these. Um, we do, uh, yeah, yeah, more regular sessions. So you can subscribe and join, join that. Why is RNA single stranded? Uh, yeah, good question. So RNA was actually the, the nucleotide, polynucleotide that evolved first. And we think that early life had RNA because RNA is all you actually need to, to store DNA, to sorry, to store genetic information and to, to copy it. You actually need one strand. So it's kind of hard to, hard to answer why it's single stranded. It's more like why is DNA double stranded? So it actually only needs to be single stranded, but being double stranded has additional benefits. So it only needs to be single stranded, but being double stranded means Means that it's more stable and it means that you can replicate it semi-conservatively so there are some benefits to being double stranded but you can still do transcription and translation with single stranded um rna so because it's not rna doesn't hang around for very long it, it gets made and it gets synthesized into protein so it doesn't really matter that it's not as stable dna can be hanging around for years some of the cells last for a long time so they need to keep that dna um, like nice and stable RNA. It doesn't matter as much. That's kind of the, um, shortest answer I could give, but yeah, good, good question. Um, sweet. Yeah. Well, let's end there then. So yeah, thanks for joining. Um, hopefully see you in one of these sessions in the future and good luck with the mock tomorrow, however that was. And, um, yeah, see you. See you soon. Um, cool. Bye, guys. Bye.